Well, good morning. I guess my question is, how do you follow that up? I don't, th- I don't, you know, it's like, who are those people? I want to meet them too. Of course, he was very true, you know, about, about you. Um, but it is good to be here. Thank you, pastors, and thank you, Jason and Sean, and just for this church, um, for your partnership with us in missions, for what we were able to do is your fault, okay? So if we're able to accomplish the kingdom of God, you're part of that. But also there's a great history for me personally in this church. As a young person, uh, I would come here. I, I was, I'm from Columbia, but we would come here. There was a strong youth group, and we would do uh, what used to be called teen talent. Now it's called fine arts and whatever, it's teen, whatever it is. But teen talent, then we did Bible quiz. And I still remember being on this, this platform as we were competing over the book of John. And I believe very much in hiding the word of God in your heart, because even as I'm reading the book of John now, I still remember all those things. And so we were part of, of a beach ministry, Operation Beach. There's just so many things that, that this church has a legacy, but I've said it before. It's not just a legacy. That legacy continues in, in the young people and the work that's going on. So we're... Uh, I'm and. Yeah, and the you know, and they never grow up, you know. Um, we never grow up. We're still having fun and enjoying what what we, what we do. But I just want to thank you as a church personally for the history, for the legacy, but also for the sowing in us and the work that we're able to accomplish. And we're partners together in that. I better give you a chance. Huh? We do want to say thank you. It has been um, a lot of fun. It's probably the most fun I've had in all of my life, serving God, being on the mission field. It's not without its struggles and challenges, but we serve a God who is bigger than any of the struggles and challenges that we encounter. And so it's just a pleasure to be here this morning, and we thank you for opening the doors for us. Just think you have a chair here, so when I get long-winded, you have a place you can sit, huh? I'm afraid to sit, because then you'll keep going. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Anyway. Well, we have been on the field in Central America for the past 25 years. We started at 12. That's why we look so young. Um, uh, But it's been a fun journey. Um, We now, we started in Belize, and we'll be talking about that in a while. But um, we serve now as area directors for the missionaries throughout the seven countries of Central America. We feel our role is as, as area pastors. We have over 100 missionaries, and you guys know the Heralds who are part of our Honduras team, and we have missionaries in all these countries who are the Cartwrights who are here. We've got, yeah, so we've got South Carolina represented um, in, in our area. And, and this morning we have, there in Latin America, the texting you do is WhatsApp. And so this morning, my WhatsApp is buzzing. It's from Costa Rica. And I think it started with the Cartwrights this morning. So I keep feeling then. We have to keep our phones with us because of all the emergencies going on. We have, I mean, some very serious things happening. But at times, the missionaries who are in lockdown start getting a little crazy. And so just, just, just pray for them this morning as they're getting a little crazy. But they are at different, you know, it, it is a tough time. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean, right now they have more than 50% of the deaths from the virus and only 10% of the population. So it gives you the reality of of what's going on. We all have friends and pastors and people we know who have have died from the virus. Um, In Nicaragua, our our national treasure just passed away quickly. He was in the hospital. He was on a ventilator. He was... They thought he was doing some better, and actually he gave this ventilator to someone else says, you're sicker than me, and within 30 minutes he passed away. And then they were having his funeral that morning, and his associate pastor passed away. So it is a very real thing, and in our part of the world, um, you know, you don't isolate. If somebody's sick, everybody's around them, and so it's very hard. Um, so it is a very real thing, uh, but I, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to, get down because we know there's always a but God. You know? We do, and I tell you, I get, the, I get the, the good hope part here. We have seen and, and continue to have our missionaries um, call us, Zoom us, and tell us the amazing things that God is doing. In the middle of craziness, in the middle of tragic times, God is doing some phenomenal things. We've had um, a group that went out to pass out food, and they knew that they had prepared 84 
um, baskets of food or bags of food, and they had a hundred bags of clothes. And they knew the area that they were going to was much larger than that, so they were going to hope to get to the most needy to be able to help them out. And so they, they went, and they went door to door, and they were there all day. And coming back, someone just got excited and said, do you know what God did? And they said, well, I'm not sure, but we've been here a long time. She says, we brought 100 bags of clothes. We gave out 200. We brought 84 bags of, of food, and we gave out 100. God is in the middle of this, and even though we don't see it, he's working. He is working. Um, we have seen just amazing things that God is doing through this time, um, our church, our, several of our missionaries have been able to go in in this quarantine and in distancing and um, hand out food in churches. And so they'd let a family come in at a time in the community and they'd pray with them and 13 people get saved. They, they hand out food and, and, and it's not just giving something that's going to relieve them of their hunger, but it's given them hope and it's given them something that's going to feed them until Jesus comes back. And so to see these things going on, it's exciting on the flip side. And those are the things we have to keep in perspective. Yes, it does seem gray, but God is working. He's in the midst of this. I really believe that God has given us this incredible opportunity. He's poised us in such a position that we can spend more time with him in prayer. And I hope that everyone is taking advantage of this. You're home a little more, spend a little more time with him. You'll be better off for it. One of our missionaries is paying, is paying, praying. is praying for the COVID-19 revival. And let me tell you, I can get excited about that idea because we know what 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then Will I answer them? God wants to answer us today. And I'm excited about this. I'm, I'm going to be the first one. I'm ready for COVID-19 revival. That's right. yeah. We're ready for COVID-19 to be over. We're ready to all, you know, and we don't know what normal is going to be like. We serve a God who's bigger. And I love when we were singing this morning about nothing is impossible. I'm thinking one of our churches in, in Managua, Nicaragua, where they're really having difficulties. And it has, it has the sign, Con Dios lo imposible no existe, which means with God, the impossible does not exist. And so whatever you're facing right now, God is able. And today we want to encourage you, we want to challenge you, and we want to, we want to challenge you to listen anew to the voice of the Lord. Because I believe with all my heart that God still speaks to his people. How many of you are with me? You think God still speaks? I think he has a message. And the message he has is all about his mission, his plan to use us to make an impact on his world. And today, for just a few moments, I want to share a, a, from a very familiar passage of Scripture. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. Um, maybe a, a real Bible, maybe an electronic. Yeah, that's right. But well, she has it all memorized, so it is, it's fine anyway. But in Joshua chapter 3, let me just kind of give you the context. For 40 years, the children of Israel have been wandering because they would not step out in faith when God told them to. They were rebellious a lot. And I've, I've been reading through again. You keep hearing, you know, hard heads. And, you know, it's easy to point fingers at them. Because we are so full of faith. We're just, you know, everything. We're so obedient. But they, had, they were at the end of the 40-year wandering. They were about to enter the promised land. But as you remember, the only two who had started the journey who were there were Joshua and Caleb. Everyone else had passed away because they, God had waited until that generation passed away because they were a rebellious lot who wouldn't trust God. But now they're at, at the Jordan River. They're about to cross over into this land they've heard about, the milk and honey. But something's about to happen a little different. Let me read. I'm going to read uh, Joshua chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and then jump down to verses 12 and 13. I encourage you to read the whole passage, but for sake of time, um, Joshua chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. 
And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Then move down to verses 12 and 13. It says, now therefore take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Now when you look at this story, they're telling them something different than what had happened in the past. See, when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea 40 years early, earlier, the water parted and they walked across on dry land. It really wasn't an act of faith. I mean, there, there were faith that the water would hold back, but the, the land was dry and they, I mean, what a huge miracle. But at this time, the water was not going to part until the priests put their foot in, until they took a step of faith. There are times, I mean, all the time, God wants us living by faith, living, stepping out in uncharted territory. It's easy to say, I've obeyed the Lord in the past. I've heard his voice, so I'm okay, I'm coasting. But the word obedience is a present tense word. I am glad for the, for the being obedient in the past, but God wants me to obey his voice now. And there are times that when I have to step out, it's something that is just complete risk. I was thinking about yesterday when I was thinking about the message, thinking about what I wanted to share. And I was thinking very seriously about hearing the voice of the Lord. Now, we, we believe that God speaks to his people. But I, I, when I was thinking about it, I said, well, okay, what do we tell? How do we, how do we tell people to hear the voice of God? And the first thing was we have to be in a place to hear the voice of God. That means relationship with the Lord. If there's some obstacle, something stopping us, something blocking that relationship, we're not going to hear from God. But it's so cool that God wants us, he wants to have relationship with us. We see God as this great judge and ready to, to chop your legs off if you do something wrong, but God wants to embrace you. He wants to surround you. He wants to minister to you. He wants to have relationship with you. So no matter what you've done, where you've come from, God loves you, has a plan for your life, and he wants to use you. So if there's something blocking in your relationship, realize that God wants to be in fellowship with you. But the second part of, of being a place to hear the voice of God is we need to learn what Elijah did, that you have to be in the quiet place. See, we're so busy. And one of the things I think we can learn through this whole, whole thing of, is learning to, to stop. I was telling, I think, Sean, before this morning, you know, we're learning some things. We're going to be stronger on the other side of this than, than we came into it. And we spent a lot of our time traveling and going and going. We realized that we're going to stop some of that. We're going to keep in contact with our missionaries. But we need to practice. There's things that we have in place now. I'm not willing to give them up. We're having a sweeter time in the presence of the Lord than I have for years. And I've, I've been a Christian um, since Methuselah. I've been serving God for a long time. But it's a new and a fresh one. And I'm jealous of that time with the Lord. And I'm not giving it up. But Elijah, he went and, and the Lord said, you know, there's a hurricane, there's, a, there's this, there's that, and there's other. But when he heard the voice of the Lord was in a sweet whisper. So I believe to hear the voice of God, we need to learn to get quiet. We need to learn to stop and give him time to speak. He's a gentleman. The second thing, to hear the voice of God means we have to have ears ready to hear what he has to say. No agenda. No determining, say, oh, Lord, I want you to bless what I'm doing. No, I want that, but I want to do what he's blessing. See, when I go to the presence of the Lord, when I go to hear his voice, he might speak to me like, say, you're going to have to step in that water, and then the water's going to part. It's not going to happen before. You're going to have to take a risk. And I believe living for God means being willing to live at risk. I'm not saying just do crazy stuff and expect God to save you. I'm saying hear the voice of God, have a, an ear to hear. <clears throat> and the third thing about the voice of God is being willing to determine to obey him. Regardless, regardless. And so today, I, I believe that God does speak to each of us. He wants us to, be, to live by faith, live by obedience, live by listening to his voice. And being willing to do what he says, even when we don't understand, even when it seems crazy, even when it seems like it's an impossible thing to do. Have you ever been in one of those places? Has the Lord ever asked something of you and you've gone, mm, no, I don't 
think so that so and so can do that. They're much better than I am, but I, they like can Moses do that. And Aaron, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I really Here don't I speak am. well. Use yeah, use him. <laughs> you know, sometimes God puts us in places to do things that we never thought we'd ever do. And even becoming a missionary, um, I've done things that I never thought I would do. We had this beautiful opportunity to host a team who was coming down, and, and they were building a church, helping us build a church, but there were a group of ladies that wanted to come, and they wanted to minister to the women. That was great. I didn't mind a bit. And then they wanted to do manicures and pedicures. Well, I was the first one to sign up. Well, we were there. It was an beautiful opportunity for our ladies um, the, from, from the States to minister to the women in Capos, Costa Rica. And so they were giving them tools. This is a, a poor area that, where the church is. And so they were giving them tools that the ladies could then go out and do something to help support their family. So we're sitting there, and, and, and the ladies, there's a long line, and, and we're praying with the ladies as we come through that we had a couple that spoke that were bilingual, and they would ask the ladies if they could, you know, had a prayer request or whatever. And so um, I got to this one area, and, and Magdalena was sitting down, and, and I went over to her, and, and I, I said, Magdalena, how can we pray for you today? And she just looked at me, just really shocked. And I thought, okay. So I put my arm around her and I said, you know what, is there something that I can pray with you about? What's going on? And she just kind of wept. And she said, if you hadn't come over and asked me this, I wouldn't have said anything. I said, okay. She says, um, I have breast cancer and the doctors suggested a mastectomy, but I'm really seeking God for what he wants. And, and I'm scared. I'm really scared. And I said, well, we're going to all stop right now and we're going to pray. Because we serve a God that can do the impossible. As Jay said, lo imposible no existe. When you're looking at God and what he can do, the impossible doesn't exist. And we prayed for Magdalena. And later she says, I, would, I, I really hadn't planned on saying anything. I said, well, God planned on doing something today, so we're going to believe that, that something's happening here. So she went home, we all did our thing, had dinner the next day, we come back and we're working with ladies and we're praying for ladies and it's great. And all of a sudden the pastor's wife's phone rings and I see her crying and just shouting for joy. She said, Magdalena had to call me before she left the doctor's office because she's cancer free, they can't find anything. When we're obedient to step out and to ask for prayer, sometimes it's just the asking we have a hard time doing. Lo imposible no existe con Dios. With God, it's not impossible to do anything. But it does take obedience. Yeah. I need to put that chair on my side, baby. I, you, know, <laughs> you know, I think of that whole story of, of the Capos and building a church there. There's a whole story that goes with that, how you were out doing ministry one time and the police came and said, you know, what are you doing? And, and you know, Nancy has this wonderful gift of peace, but she also has the gift of sarcasm. And it was one of those days that she wanted to let, you know, the police were there and she said, I mean, it was pretty obvious to doing children's ministry. They were ministering, but she didn't. And the police said, no, I want to know how to do what you're doing. And come to find out this, this police officer was in charge of a task force to go into the schools because so many kids are being exploited. There were sexual, all these things going on and they're trying to tell them how to say no, but they couldn't get their attention. She says, I watch what you do and you're able to hold the attention of these kids. Can you come train my policeman how to do children's ministry? Well, you know, just so happens what God can do when we're in the right place. When we're willing to be obedient, even though it seems a little crazy, it seems a little different. When Nancy and I started, we started serving as missionaries in Belize. And I remember it, we used to have youth camp at Kings Mountain and uh, years ago. And I remember, uh, you know, I, I, I talked about this last time. I had a Rock Hill guy who was my camp counselor that week that I was, that I was called. And I remember specifically God speaking. And as, when Nancy and I got married, even though we were in ministry, we know there, there, was a, there was a burden for the country of Belize. Well, we finally got there after a number of years and we were serving, we were pastoring, leading schools, doing children's ministry. And one day the Lord spoke to us where we felt like he really was clear and said, we want you to build a high school. 
Now, when you think of missionaries, you think missionaries plant churches, build this, school. It seemed contrary to to what, but we knew in our heart that God was speaking to, and we didn't know why, but we began to learn the need was great because only half the kids could go to high school, and those who got to go had money or grades, good grades. Those who didn't, what kind of hope do they have? What does a 13-year-old have when they finish school if they don't have any further education? So we heard the voice of God, and we said, we're going to obey the voice, and we thought everything would just fall together. Now, just so you know, just because God speaks and tells you to do something, it doesn't mean it's going to come together tomorrow, and it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I have learned by experience, doors slammed in my face. I've learned from experience building on a piece of property that was given to us, all of a sudden realized that, oops, we made a mistake. You know, that's somebody else's property. Losing significant amount of investment, thinking, I am not looking for work, Lord. You know, so what is with this? And it, there were times I said, Nancy, I am tired of this. We have enough to do. Let's forget this high school. And then Nancy would say, what is the Lord speaking? She played the God card. And I knew what the Lord was speaking. So we kept moving forward. That high school was an a exercise in building character in us, I think. It was beautifully done eventually, but there was a, there was a process to get through it. And um, I will never forget the first day of school. We drove up and there are kids lined up ready to go into school with their uniforms on and they were ready to go their first day at New Hope High School. And I was excited because I was going to have the opportunity to teach Bible and leadership. And so I was really excited about having these kids, getting to meet them, get to know them, build relationship. Oh, the Lord had already said, you know, break them up into small group discipleships a couple times a week and just really pour into them. We were seeing kids getting saved. It was fantastic. I was loving it. But we also had a program with the school because there were kids, as Jay said, many did not have the income to be able to attend school. So we had a program that was a work study program. So these kids could work a couple afternoons, an hour or so after school to pay off their school bill. We had one little girl, Elizabeth Beltran. She was just an absolute delight. She's pretty as can be. Um, Always had a big smile on her face. Always had her homework done. Great grades. And she was on this work study program. And I'm going to tell you something. The bell would ring, and it's like she disappeared into thin air. And we'd say, um, Elizabeth, it, it, it's your turn. I know, I know, miss. I know, I know. Um, I'll, I'll be there. I'll, I'll be there the next time. I, I'm going to be there. Every time it happened, we'd call her in. She'd cry, I'm so sorry. I, I want, I, I'll do it. I'll do better. I'll do better. What we didn't know is that Elizabeth, as a 14-year-old, her mom was living with a man who was paying for the rent and helping to put groceries on the table, and he demanded that she come home every afternoon so that he could abuse her. The truth of the matter is, New Hope High School, Elizabeth never wanted to leave that place. Never wanted to leave that place. But she didn't have a choice. What could we do? When we found out about it, oh, I'm going to call DSS right now. No, you don't do that. What we could do is we could pray for her and show her a Jesus who loved her and didn't look at anything that was going on in the home, but he loved her every step of the way. We could give her an education that would get her out of that home eventually. God is way bigger. New Hope High School became a refuge for Elizabeth. It became a way of life for her to survive. What if we had said, oh, really, Lord, I'm, <laughs> I'm just too tired. I don't, I don't think I want to do that now. I, get somebody else to build that high school. Obedience is costly. But for Elizabeth, it was her freedom. It's kind of neat. We left uh, uh, Belize and been serving in uh, basing out of Costa Rica. But we've never left a burden for Belize. It's one of the countries that we go into regularly. And over the past couple of years, we've seen there's been a huge need in the country. Um, in Belize, we love it, but there's a, there's a serious problem with uh, moral uh, failures, serious problem with financial integrity, and we've seen it from the government, but also in, in the local churches. And what we began to realize is that it's not just leadership skills, but it's 
training young people with character, the character of Christ. Not focusing only on competency, but focusing on what does it mean to live for God. In a, in a place where, where, where many men have a sweetheart and that's on the side and that's kind of acceptable, unfortunately it's entered the church life as well. And so God is speaking to us about going back and getting involved in New Hope and other places as well and starting a project called Project Accelerate. Because we've got to raise up young people who are willing to take the place. We have some young people who have great skills, but they're not living godly lives. We've seen some great successes through New Hope. We have Le- uh, Levi and his wife who were passing from our first class, passing a church, Melanie and her husband. We have Libni, we have different stories, but there's a huge need in that country for something to happen. So would you pray with us as we go back? We're hearing the voice of God. We're not looking for work. You know, we, we don't, you know, not having to look something to do, but God is speaking again in the same way. He's challenging us. So as we're looking to go back when we, when we get back home, uh, we're going to be working in Belize and raising up young people in a challenging program. It's going to be physically challenging. It's going to be spiritually challenging. We're going to challenge young people to live a life of purity in a, in a culture where purity is mocked. We would love to have your prayer support. We've got prayer cards, new ones. Haven't been here a while, so we got new ones. Um, But we. One of the sisters prays for us every day. Yes, yes. We'll make sure you get a prayer. Absolutely, absolutely. But there are three specific ways that you can pray for us. Number one is the three P's. Pray the three P's for the Dickersons. The first one is presence. Um, Moses said in 33. I mean, Moses said in 33. Yeah, Moses said in Exodus 33, um, verse 15, I believe. God, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want to leave here. And that's the way we want to, we, we want to leave, we want to operate, we want to move in the presence of God. So pray that the Lord's presence would be with us in everything that we do. The second thing we'd like to ask you to pray for is for protection. Not just for us, but for all our workers. Uh, Last week, one of our workers, they were in Guatemala, and they were out delivering food. And they got held up at gunpoint. Somebody stopped, jumped out, held them at gunpoint, stole their money. And they're doing fine. And you have to understand, people are starving. And so you're having to understand, we're living in different times. But God did spare their lives that day because other people were being shot. But God protected them. Would you pray for protection for our workers, for us, for our pastors and the many people? Protection from, from, from the virus, but protection from, from evil and how the, Lord, how the enemy wants to destroy. And the third way is provision. We need the Lord's provision because this project, it's bigger than we are, but it's something God's called us to, and so we're excited about it. But this this project is going to cost us about $50 a student to get it going, and that's nothing to God. I know that he's going to be able to take care of this for us, but we need your prayers that the Lord would just provide the finances that we need to be able to go back to Belize and institute project accelerate and get these kids full of God, full of integrity, full of character, full of high morals so that they can make a difference in their country. Amen. And the provision, we need churches like you who will help us get back to the field. If we have 10 or 15 more churches like you, we can go home. And home for us is Central America. So would you pray for us, for this project, but also, but we serve a big God. And I, I just, you know, our story, we're very passionate about it, but I believe that God has a story for each of us. That God wants to use you both where you are and where you're not. How do we, that crazy missionary, where we are, God has places of ministry in this church, in this community. But where we're not, we pray for others, we pray for workers, and we sin. We're part of what they do. So I want to challenge you to be quiet and listen to the voice of God. Because he wants to speak to you. Second, realize that when he speaks, it might not be on your agenda of what you think. Because see, God wants you stepping out in faith. And and maybe it's you have to step in the water before the waters part. But the third thing, be willing to obey and do what he says. Without reservation, no holding back. 
with the potential for failure because God works in the middle of impossible situations. Con Dios lo imposible no existe. With God, the impossible does not exist. God bless you.